Hi everybody, I've got Aaron Sloman here who holds an honorary position at the University of Birmingham. Officially retired, but still has an honorary position there. He was on the panel of judges uh, on the recent Turing test that has made m many waves in the media um, that was held at the, the in London at the Royal Society. So Aaron, would you like to just give us a background uh, of what actually went down at the event in London just recently? Right. Well, um, it was an attempt to continue a series of episodes in which a collection of chatbots, and I'll call them that without intending it to be derogatory or anything, um, that uh, were capable of having some sort of conversation with a human. And uh, the series was motivated by a prediction that Turing made in his 1950 paper on computing machinery and intelligence, where he said that by the end of the century, that was 50 years later, it should be possible for a computer-based system uh, to take part in a sort of test where you have two displays which might be just textual displays uh, uh, showing on the one hand what a human is typing in answer to some typed in questions and on the other hand maybe at the same time or possibly later uh, showing what a computer types back in answer to some typed in questions um, and Turing uh, is generally uh, understood to have proposed this as a test for intelligence, although it's quite clear if you go and read his paper that he thought proposing a test for intelligence was rather silly, and I totally agree with him about that. Instead, he was making a prediction that in this sort of interaction, uh, about 50 years later, um, computer-based systems would be able to fool at least 30% of average humans sitting at their terminals in a five-minute interaction. Now, that's a rather modest capability he was predicting, um, although it turned out to take uh, longer for computers to reach that level than uh, some people thought. And the reason he made that prediction was not because he thought that was a test that would be passed, but because he was aware of a collection of philosophers and others who had argued that machines cannot think, reason, and uh, generally behave like humans. And he just wanted to refute their arguments as applied to this sort of interaction. Their arguments, he thought, would show, if they were correct, that machines would not be able to take part in this sort of uh, verbal interaction. Uh, and he just demolished the arguments. There were about seven or eight of them. And I don't remember the details, and I won't try to go through them now. They're in the paper. And that was very interesting, uh, because he wasn't far out. Uh, he made some other predictions. For instance, he said the computers by that time would have about 10 to the 9 bits of memory, and that was amazingly accurate. Um, anyway, uh, so many people thought he was proposing a test for intelligence, and there's been a succession of attempts to set up such tests. For a while, Leibner, who was, I think, the inventor of LEDs, offered a lot of money for the first machine that met this criterion. Uh, but they're always, it's always been controversial. There are many computer scientists and AI researchers and philosophers who think that it's a po pointless thing to do because the ability to pass that sort of test doesn't prove anything interesting about the machine. Anyway, uh, that's the background, uh, and I could now go on to what happened on Saturday, unless you have any more questions about the background. Yeah, sure. Just one more question about the background. There seems to be some disagreement amongst the, uh, the AI community. Um, one of them in particular, um, what's his name? Uh, J James Copeland uh, from the Turing Archives. Jack, Jack, Copeland. Jack Copeland. That's right, yeah, yeah. yes. Um, who I will be interviewing on Monday or Friday. Um, yeah. And he says that the the thirty percent uh, model um, was actually a, like a prediction and not part of a Turing like the test which he 
uh, meant to describe earlier in the paper, or something like that. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, I, I recognise the point. Uh, as I said earlier, some people think Turing was proposing a test and that he was claiming that people, the computers would pass the test by the end of the century. Now, I agree with Jack Copeland, uh, although not everybody does agree, uh, that Turing was not proposing a test, and I would think it would be, for reasons we can discuss later, I would think it a very stupid thing to propose, and I think Turing very clearly thought it would be a stupid thing to propose, but he was making prediction because he wanted to use the prediction to refute arguments. So he wasn't predicting that a test would be passed, he was just predicting that computers would be able to do some things that people had claimed they couldn't do. And then he tried to argue against the people who claimed that the computers couldn't do those things. Yes. Okay. Uh, he sometimes slipped into using the word test in his paper, and I think that's partly why he sometimes called it the imitation game, yeah. and he referred to it in different ways. Um, unfortunately, uh, many people uh, who haven't read the paper, who are not as clever as Turing, have uh, sort of taken up this idea and thought it would be a good thing to do, to set up a test, and they've tried to um, uh, refine the test and add stronger conditions and do various things. We can come back to that later on, because I think all the attempts to improve the specification of the test are totally misguided. But what happened on Saturday was that a group of people, including um, uh, Professor Kevin Warwick from previously well-known for things he had been doing at the University of Reading, although he's now moved to the University of Coventry, I think, mm. and his collaborator, Dr. Huma Shah, mm. and other people, uh, arranged this um, uh, meeting, which I think started on the Friday, and I wasn't involved in that, and then continued on the Saturday, and it in, had seven sessions, uh, sorry, six sessions of tests, and in each test, there were five computer programs mm -hmm. and each program was uh, made available to each of several judges alongside a human. So there were some humans and there were these five programs. Mm -hmm. So at any time, I think there were f five judges and they were sitting in front of screens which were split down the middle Ah. So that uh, the the human would see on one side the computer uh, responses to questions, and there and there would be a box to type into that uh, computer, and on the other side a human with a box at the bottom to type in. But the judge did not know which was the computer and which was the human. Mm. And this went on for five minutes, after which the screen went blank, and that test was finished. Mm. So. Uh, in a session of five minutes, there would be a number of judges sitting in the same room, each staring at a screen with two, two sides um, with a split panel, and uh, talking to two individuals. And then after the five minutes were up, they had a sheet of paper with uh, the session number and a collection of questions, like did you think you, uh, A or B was a human or a machine, and express your confidence level, and then there were a few other questions. Did you think the human was a child or a teenager or an adult? And there may have been something else. But the main thing was, uh, could you tell which one was a machine? And uh, what was the sort of uh, level of certainty? Um, so that meant that each of the machines uh, was involved in 30 tests because there were six sessions and five humans per session, and uh, the humans went through all the machines. Uh, I don't know how, how, whether the, hu whether the, um, the um, sorry, uh, when I said humans, I mean the judges were, there were five judges at a time, okay. and they went through all the machines. Mm -hmm. Now the humans who were at the other end, alongside the computers, may have changed, and I believe there were various ages, but I don't know how many of them there were and how how often they were recycled or whatever. Um, I uh, think the humans were told not to try to pretend to be machines, but just to try to respond to the interactions. The judges were told absolutely nothing about the computers, what they were trying to do. Many of the news reports 
suggested that the judges knew that one was attempting to emulate a Russian teenager. Um, that might have been uh, something that the uh, computer said about itself in response to some of the questions, but it wasn't specified in advance, and I don't remember that coming out in um, any of the things that uh, that happened in my interaction, but I don't remember all the details. Mm. So is that set up fairly clear? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. It seems to be, yeah. I mean, like, just you want to elaborate on your involvement particularly? Okay. Well, I'll just say that at the end of all that, there was a period when they were hastily going through all the uh, transcripts and also through uh, what the judges had written on the answer sheets, and they announced... Uh, just before I had to leave, so I didn't hear all the rest of the discussion, that uh, one third, ten out of the thirty judges had been fooled by one of the programs, and that was the Eugene Guzman one, which was this Russian, uh, pretending to be a Russian teenager. And there was much uh, applause and whatever, because that had gone past the thirty percent limit. Um, some people have said that uh, this limit had been passed long ago by lots of other things. For instance, in the 1960s, Kenneth Colby wrote a program called Parry, which simulated an artificially paranoid uh, human. Mm -hmm. And uh, quite a lot of psychiatrists were fooled by that for far longer than five minutes uh, when they were interacting with it. Um, whether that shows that the test, uh, that Turing's prediction was met long before the end of the century, or whether it's not an example of what he's predicting is, you know, you can argue about that. And then there have been other previous episodes where some people claim that um, the uh, uh, prediction was satisfied. There are also debates about um, whether the time was long enough, because if you had a five-minute session with both individuals on the screen at the same time, then that meant that a judge only had about two and a half minutes um, and per individual, unless you know one went very fast and the other slowly or something. Mm. Um, so there were possi possible problems with the setup, although if they had allowed five minutes each, for that is ten minutes per pair, then the whole thing would have would not have been able to, they couldn't have done it in the time available, they'd have needed an extra day and so on, and probably it would have cost a lot more, etc., renting the room and so on. So that's stuff about the mechanics. Now, um, my own opinion about what was going on, I've always thought these Turing tests are essentially a waste of time because I don't think they yield any scientific or philosophical insight into anything. Uh, I've built a chatbot myself, I've taught students how to do it, and I know the kinds of techniques that can be used and so on, and I don't think they demonstrate anything really interesting about trying to match human or even uh, any animal kind of intelligence. Hmm. So I've always in the past refused to take part in any of these things. But when I was asked this time, I agreed, just simply out of curiosity, I thought it would be a chance to find out what the current best... I didn't ask how they were going to select the competitors, but I just assumed they'd get good ones, which may not have been a correct assumption. So I went along just to find out how well they did. And um, I wasn't expecting very much, but I thought it might just be fun. And in fact, from my own personal experience, I had the impression that in every case I identified the machine within the first three questions. Uh, but I don't know yet because there seems to have been some complication about the process by which they did all the, the, um, the adding up. They didn't keep the records in a form which enabled them to tell all the participants how they had done. Hmm. So when I said... Um, I'm getting calls from uh, from uh, uh, reporters and such like who want to ask me questions, and it's it would be useful to know whether I'd been fooled or not. Uh, they were said, uh, "Sorry, that it's going to take a bit of time to sort the stuff out," and partly because the main organizer was actually just about to depart on holiday. So I do not know for sure how many I got right, although I think I got them all very quickly because um, of the clues that I had in front of me. 
Um, there have been claims made about how this is a landmark event and so on, and that has annoyed many AI people and computer scientists because they think it was really uh, an, a rather insignificant event. You, have you seen some of the um, stuff in the papers and on blogs and such like? I've interviewed Ben Goetzel, Anders Sandberg, uh, um, and who else? Robin Hansen. Okay. So I've interviewed oh, so them and I've read the blogs. I've read some of them. I can't say... I okay, but anyway, <laughs> well, I, I don't know the views of the people you've just referred to about this particular event. Um, but I presume they weren't terribly impressed. Well, Ben anyway. certainly wasn't. Um, Anders Sandberg said that it was more like a. It was more interesting how people reacted to the 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 Turing test rather than the actual program. The interesting yeah. thing was the people's responses rather than um, you know the the way that uh, these chatbots are configured to sort of hijack people's vulnerabilities, their gullibility, rather than yeah. the actual sophistication, the cognitive sophistication of the uh, the chatbots themselves. Yes, I think that's a general point about chatbots rather than about this particular test. That's another way of saying that I was, uh, the same sort of point as I was making, that they don't tell us anything very much about intelligence. Mm -hmm. There's a large collection of tests, uh, of tricks, and um, some of them produce quite entertaining results. Uh, you may have come across the video which I think came out of MIT where two chatbots with speech generators were made to talk to each other or maybe the same one talking to a clone of itself and they unexpectedly got into a theological discussion or something, <laughs> which was very funny. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll see if I can dig up the URL and send it to you or you, maybe you'll find, find yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's yeah. cool. I'll put it in the description of the video. Yeah. Um, uh, I thought it would be fairly easy to um, suss out which is which by asking very simple questions about everyday things that are unlikely to have come up in somebody's database. Uh, for example, or, or saying something. So, for example, uh, the, f the first or second statement I typed into all of them was something like, uh, my new hearing aids will enable us to communicate better. And I thought the humans would all say something about the irrelevance of hearing aids to purely textual interaction. And to my amazement, nobody did. <laughs> uh, so that didn't turn out to be as good a, um, uh, a probe as I had thought. Although one person responded with a, just a single word, brilliant. And I still don't know whether that was a computer, I don't know for sure, but that was just a computer that um, responded to a word like improve or, or help or something like that by saying brilliant as, a, as an expression of pleasure or something, or whether it was a human who was doing the same thing, just saying, because I'd said we'll communicate well, he said, oh, brilliant. Or whether it was a human who realized that I was trying to tap the computer by um, making this statement and thought it was a good probe and said brilliant. So I'll never know. Anyway, there, there were other things like uh, typing in, is Fred there? And if you do that to a human as your first interaction over a teletype, you, you will normally get some sort of expression of surprise, you know, who's Fred or uh, don't anybody call Fred or whatever. Whereas when a computer says it's against my moral principles to answer that sort of question, uh, if you get that answer, you know it's not a human <laughs> it's a computer. And um, there were a few other simple things. Um, I believe in an email message to one of the reporters, Marvin Minsky, Minsky said you can ask the computer whether you can uh, push something with a piece of string or pull it. And this uh, goes back to Eisenhower once being asked about leadership and he said, well, you have to think of it in terms of string. You can pull things with a piece of string but not push, although exactly what that's supposed to mean isn't clear. But it's certainly, as far as the fact about string is concerned, yes. Anyway, um, I think people who adopt that approach of testing the understanding of everyday factors in the facts about the environment and the kinds of things that can or can't happen 
can fairly easily trip up these computers because it doesn't take a huge amount of skill to come up with an example that just won't have been put into the database. Um, but I'd rather, perhaps, perhaps I should go back to why I think the whole kind of search for a test for intelligence is misguided because there are a lot of people who said this test is no good but he has a better one and then they say it should interact physically with objects or um, they uh, say you must test it for a much longer time because five minutes is too short and so on. Uh, and uh, Stephen Harnad, I don't know if you've come across his work, in the past has proposed something he calls the total Turing test where the um, the robot really must have a lot of sensors and must be able to move around and manipulate things and do all sorts of things that a human would do or an animal would do, totally immersed in the environment over an extended period of time. Um, and I, I think even that is is missing something deep. And the way I like to explain this is to say what Turing did in 1936 uh, when he first devised a Turing machine. He didn't say, now let's set up a collection of tests for whether a machine is doing a computation and then we'll see if the machine can satisfy these tests. Instead, he analyzed certain sorts of computations which until then had mostly been done by humans, numerical calculations and, and logical deductions and so on. And he tried to decompose the requirements for being able to do all those things and then he uh, managed to find a specification for a relatively simple machine that if set up in the right way could uh, be programmed to model any interaction of the kind that he had uh, analyzed. And he proved things about what this thing could be, although it, it wasn't one machine that could do them all it was a framework which could be programmed to do any of them. And he also proved that there's a special uh, subset of those machines, which are the universal Turing machines, that can be programmed to imitate all the others, any of the others rather. So uh, the main thing was he set, did some analysis of requirements for some kind of capability. He then specified a machine that he claimed could meet those requirements and then he proved mathematically that it could meet the requirements and he also showed that it wouldn't just pass some particular set of tests but an infinite variety of of capabilities could be encoded into this machine uh, which he demonstrated. Now let's, con let's transfer that to how you would need to specify or design a machine to behave like a human or a um, orangutan or a weaver bird, you'd have to start by having a deep theory of what the humans or the orangutans or the weaver birds do, what kinds of tasks they can perform, what kinds of capabilities are required for those tasks. You then have to specify a kind of machine which would in those cases presumably have sensors of various kinds as well as abilities to interact with the environment and then you'd need to be able to demonstrate that a machine with the specification you'd given would be able to perform in all the ways that you've analyzed uh, as being required for being an orangutan or a weaver bird or something. Now in doing that, you would need to show not just that it passed some 10 or 20 or 1,000 actual tests or went through its life fooling people, but you would have to have a deep theory explaining why it was capable of doing all those things. And um, in the case of humans, you need something even more complicated than that because humans differ at different stages in their development. A newborn baby would fail the so-called Turing test because it can't even type or talk or do anything. But that same newborn baby, while interacting with its environment, which includes parents and other things, including its toes and so on, 
a few years later becomes a toddler that can start communicating, playing games uh, and talking and then a few years later might be able to start reading and writing and, and uh, learning about a little bit about arithmetic and inventing stories and playing games. And then sometime later than that, it'll be passing examinations at school or maybe uh, doing well at some game, cricket or, or um, football or playing a violin. And sometime later on, it might be a university student. Later on, it might be a retired professor of philosophy. And at all those different stages, it not only, can, not only can do different things, but it can learn to extend itself. I'm learning all the time, even at my age. Um, but I, the things I can learn now are, are include things I couldn't possibly have learned when I was a teenager, because that learning usually takes a background to build on. So if you have a deep theory about the requirements to, for going through all those different stages, and then you can build a machine, what you'll have to have when it starts off is something like what I believe is in the human genome. Uh, Jackie Chappell and I wrote a paper about this which, um, well, the, long, the most detailed version was published in 2007 and I'll send you the uh, reference. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea was that as humans develop, they go through stages of acquiring competences by trying things out and, and playing in the environment. And this doesn't necessarily have to be driven by a teacher. It might just be toddlers playing with their toys when nobody else is around. And from that, they acquire some generalizations uh, which they can then use to do more things. But after a while, uh, the genome specifies that it's time for a new process to take off, which examines what has been learned so far and then tries to find structure in what has been learned so far and reorganize that structure. Mm. The uh, developmental neuropsychologist Annette Karmeloff-Smith had a similar idea and she describes that process as representational redescription. Now there is one example of that that most people know about and I think there are many examples that haven't been discovered yet. The example that's well known is occurs in language learning. Uh, certainly in English language learning and I suspect in all human language learning. Children, normal children who are surrounded by speaking, adults and so on, uh, develop abilities to communicate quite well and they seem to do this by learning lots of patterns that work. Um, me hungry or fish please or I want that or whatever. And then after they, they've got be quite competent and they also hear what other people are saying and understand them. They seem to change and transform their understanding into a grammar based understanding where there are rules of various kinds and those rules say how you can assemble components of the language to express new meanings in principled ways. And that's very powerful because up to that point there will be a whole collection of patterns that they've got and they can only express what's in those patterns. Maybe with slight variations by replacing a word in a pattern. But when you've got a grammar, you can say, uh, please will you put the cup inside the cupboard where I put my toy elephant because I don't want the teddy bear to see it. And the child may never have heard a sentence with that kind of complex structure before but the components are grammatically well formed and they're put together in a way that generates a structured meaning. But when, when children go through the transformation from pattern-based understanding to syntax-based understanding, they start making mistakes they didn't make before. And that's how this has been noticed. So a child who used to say, um, Johnny hit me and I ran away, will now say, Johnny hitted me and I run away because the child has learnt the grammatical rules for forming the past tenses of verbs by adding the id sound, hit it, run. And in English, that's wrong because many verbs are exceptions to the general rules. But the child is now using rules with, instead of just learned patterns. And this goes on for a while and nothing you can say to the child will change it. The mother can say, don't say hit it, say hit. <laughs> don't say I stuck 
the picture on the wall, say I stuck the picture on the wall, or I stick the picture on the wall, uh, it's no good. And the child will just go on saying it, mm. stick it. Later, the children do what, if it were in a computer, would require a clever software engineer. They build mechanisms for dealing with the exceptions. And they understand the exceptions in the input, and they produce the exceptions in the output. And so they learn which verbs are uh, the, uh, the strong verbs that don't conform to the normal rules and which ones are not and so on. Uh, similarly with male and female forms and other things. And they handle both the powerful rules and a lot of exceptions. Hmm. And, and that transformation has sometimes been referred to as a U-shaped learning curve. U because their competence goes up with the pattern learning and then it goes down in some ways when they get the grammatical learning and then it goes up again when they transform their grammatical competence by adding root mechanisms for exception. Anyway, that's just one example of a kind of learning that's based on an extended period of, of interaction with the environment, picking up generalizations, and then something that's in the genome which was sort of ready for this wakes up mechanisms in the brain, which then take that apparatus, that uh, information, and reorganize it and do something powerful with it. And Annette Carmelov smith says this representational redescription description happens in many different domains, at many stages of development, and I completely agree with her. In fact, I didn't use her language. I was saying this in connection with mathematical development, and then when I read her stuff, I realized she was talking about the same kind of thing. And I talked about the biologist Jackie Chappell, who'd worked with birds and knew a lot more than I did about varieties of development in animals. And um, so between us, we tried to formalize, or well, not formalize, uh, uh, spell out this theory in a more general way than I've given it to you today. So that's an example of how one might have. Uh, some observations about forms of learning and how they change over time in the life of an individual and might start formulating a theory about the requirements for the mechanisms to, to generate those forms of learning and, and then build a working model of it. And I haven't done that yet because it's quite difficult. And in particular, I think some of what goes on in connection with spatial understanding is very hard to implement on computers using any current um, uh, known techniques of programming and so on. So maybe at some future date we will have theory about what's in the human genome that enables these different kinds of things to happen and subsets of that will be in other animals and other things that you'll have in other animals are not in humans. For instance, the amazing things that weaver birds do when they go and uh, collect uh, leaves and then they tie knots in them and, and weave them together and make a, a nest hanging from a branch. Mm. Uh, there are nice videos showing that. Mm. Um, and one might have to do this differently for different kinds of intelligence. And it may well be that instead of all humans being the same, there are some within the framework of the general human genome, there are many variants which allow different kinds of responses to the same environment. So one would want not just one theory, one would want a pattern of theories. And then you would be explaining not one person's capabilities, not one collection of tests, but a huge and infinite variety of developmental trajectories. And one example would be that uh, the baby robots that have these kinds of things might grow up into philosophers. And some of those philosophers would talk like Dave, Daniel Dennett, and some would talk like John Searle, and some would talk like uh, Roger Penrose, <laughs> and so on. And that will be different, but they'd have the same general framework that produces this variety. And then we'd have a deep theory, and we'd have some sort of demonstration of how it works, but we'd have a sort of mathematical analysis of what's in the theory that enables it to do all those things. And that would be comparable to what Turing did when he said there were these kinds of computations, symbolic operations on uh, logical expressions and numbers and so on. And if we build a machine, which he called his, the, the machine that we now call the Turing machine, it can do all those things. 
But that's much, much simpler than what I'm talking about. And it might take several hundred more years to do what I'm talking about. So that's what interests me, and that's related to what I call the metamorphogenesis project, which we talked about mm. previously, because mm. I think we have to understand the many layers in evolution mm. that got us to this point. I don't think we can just look at humans and study our brains and find out how it all works. I think it's a, that's a dead end. Mm. We need to go back in time. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. And I just want to um, let viewers know that there is a video on this channel about the metamorphosis. So metamorphogenic pro project, which uh, it was basically a lecture as part of the uh, Winter Intelligence Conference, and also a number yeah. interview with you separately. Yeah, so. Yes, the interview uh, went through a subset of this, and then the um, the longer lecture uh, on the following day was a rather la rambling thing, but it went through yeah. a lot more detail. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was wonderful. Yeah. So <laughs> look, um, there has been some, uh, I guess. A, a, amendments to the Turing test that people have been trying to institute, but are you yeah. relatively skeptical about anybody's ability to test intelligence in the machine, or to? Yeah, because there's some well, AI guys, or Ben Gertzel's doing some stuff. And yes, that there's some reasonable ways to go about it. You might know about it. I know Ben. I don't know this particular uh, feature of his work, or if I have read about it, I've forgotten about it. Mm. But I don't see anything wrong with trying to set targets, mm. um, but just setting performance targets. Excuse me. Yeah. Just setting performance targets, and then trying to find out which machines, which designs for machines, will enable those performances to be met. Uh, may be interesting as an engineering task. It may be interesting as a scientific task if, in doing it, you discover something new about a form of computation, a form of design, a form, a way in which some generic capability might be instantiated in multiple, differently in multiple contexts and so on. But if it's just, here's this task, what do we have to do to get the machine to do it, then it may be interesting for engineering purposes if you really want a machine that can spray chairs with paint. Uh, maybe not trivial to make it do it accurately for different kinds of chairs. But when you've done it, you won't necessarily have learned anything much about biological intelligence if that's all it can do. If it comes out of something more general which can learn to do that, and if you put it in a different environment, it can learn to play with Meccano sets and assemble toy cranes and cars or whatever, uh, animals, and in another context you can learn to play the violin and so on, then that's much deeper and you won't be able to do that without having a deep theory about the requirements for those diverse capabilities. Right, and and you believe that we don't have deep theories. I, I don't know myself, but um, that's something that you think we don't have at the moment? Uh, I think we don't, although there are some people who think they do. But as far as I know, they all f the people who think they do have a kind of pattern which assumes that uh, humans and other animals are input-output devices where the uh, input signals and the output signals get fed into a learning machine which looks for patterns using lots of statistical analysis and tries to construct probabilistic prediction prediction uh, mechanisms using Bayes nets or something else uh, so that they can uh, reliably predict what perceptions they will have in response to output signals and then later on if they have goals although it's not clear where the goals would come from but never mind uh, then they can work out what kinds of output signals to generate in order to reliably get back the input signals. And that's the sort of pattern of uh, thinking about the nature of animal intelligence, which goes back quite a long way. There's a person called William T. Powers about 30 years ago who um, talked about behavior as being the control of perception, but that's just a detail. He was mainly, he was basically thinking in that way. And more recently, others have been thinking like that. And that makes all intelligence a matter of probabilistic learning about relationships between inputs and outputs. 
And I think that will fail because um, it's clear that evolution did much more than that. In particular, individual organisms, for many purposes, need to have ways of representing not their own inputs and their outputs, but what's out there in the environment. And what's out there even when they're not looking at, sensing it, or acting on it. So, for instance, if you were an organism that it needs different kinds of food at different ki times, in, and the food's in different places, and perhaps you have a nest in some place, you need to have a way of representing the fact that these places exist, even when they're not producing any sensory inputs to you. And you may be doing lots of moving around, and that's not going to necessarily affect any of those places. And the ways of representing those things seems to require either the invention or in some or perhaps in some cases the provision through evolutionary mechanisms, the um, prior capability to represent space as something that you're inside and all sorts of other things are inside. And you, some things may have fixed locations. Other things can move around in relation to those locations. Uh, things may have parts that are related to one another spatially. Some of those things will be rigid, so the spatial relations can't easily be changed. Others will be flexible, like a piece of string or this cable, which has parts that can change when I bend it like that. So, Learning about an environment which has many kinds of places, many kinds of stuff, many kinds of properties of stuff, many kinds of behaviors that the bits of stuff and the things that are made of bits of stuff can have, and even can have other intelligent things that are looking for some of the same stuff as you're looking for, competing for your food, or may, or may want to eat you, or things that you may want to eat, and and then thinking of them as having perceptual capabilities so that not only are they physical objects but they're information processes and then you may need to be able to think about what they what information they're getting and what they can do with it so if it's something that might want to eat your babies then if you see it coming towards your nest you may not want it to get close enough to see where the babies are so you might pretend to be injured and move away from the nest and that's what some birds do. I don't know if they know they're doing it. I don't know if they know they're doing it because that's a way of deceiving the predator into chasing them yeah. and getting it away from the nest. But it could be something that an intelligent animal does. A human might do something like that. And then when the animal is far enough away, the bird will fly away or the human will climb a tree or something. So there's in order to be able to represent all that richness outside yourself, you have to have deep theories about what kind of environment you're embedded in. And somehow biological evolution didn't give us all the theories, but gave us mechanisms for generating those theories in ways that are different depending on where we live, whether we live in a desert or on a farm or in a cave or in a skyscraper or whatever. And um, I don't believe that any of the statistical learning systems will be able to come up with anything like that. And furthermore, uh, long before we had modern mathematics, a subset of humans started noticing mathematical structures in their theories, which led to the development of Euclidean geometry. And over 2,000 years ago, Euclid's book, The Elements, uh, had a massive amount of knowledge. I, I think it's probably the single most important book ever produced by human beings. And nobody knows how that came out of humans who had no math teachers, who might have lived in caves or in all kinds of environments without the kinds of resources that we have for doing mathematics. But I suspect it was because that biological evolution, in some sense, gave them mechanisms for learning about space and time and motion and relationships and so on. And then later gave them abilities to reflect on their own thinking and their own perception and so on. So that's something I hadn't talked about before. I talked about thinking about other individuals thinking, what other things might see you doing and so on. Mm -hmm. But being able to reflect on your own thinking is very important. For instance, 
if you try to do something, you make a plan and it fails. Mm. Mm. So it seems. And so previously, it's, yeah. Well, it seems so. It's um, particularly difficult then, uh, in your view, to be able to detect intelligence. To you know, a strong degree in a in an agent, um, in an artificial agent. You know, we can assume that other people are intelligent, uh, but you know, we we can't really assume that rational agents uh, that we create are intelligent very easily. Uh, so, if that's the case, that it's going to be very hard to predict when we're really approaching true artificial general intelligence. So, without any reliable indicators as to uh, how to predict um, artificial general in intelligence, should we then be prepared to be surprised when it does actually come along, if it does? Well, I'd like to backtrack a bit because if someone built a robot in a laboratory mm. and after a few years or months or whatever, it might learn much faster than human beings, it comes up to me and has a conversation and then um, I take it to uh, see my new computer and it starts asking me how it works and what it does and uh, and uh, I have no reason to believe it's seen that computer before and so on or I uh, show it um, children's toys and it starts playing with things and, and, and it, it might even discover that it can rearrange blocks into various patterns make rectangular arrays, you know, three by two and so on and then um, uh, when I say, okay, here's one more block, can you make it in a pattern? It starts trying and finds it can't anymore. And it starts getting puzzled. Why could I do it with three by two and then I add one more block? I can't do it anymore. It might discover prime numbers because seven is a prime. <laughs> so if that sort of thing started happening, then I would have very little doubt that uh, it's working things out in a, in a human-like way because it's very unlikely that any programmer could have anticipated the succession of things that I do with it. But merely discovering that it can do that would not, for me, be all that interesting. I would want to know what the principles are that went into the design that enabled right. it to yeah. do that. And so we need a deep theory. And I think the deep theory is going to be much more complicated than any of the kinds of current designs for AI systems. Right, okay, that may be so. Now, previously it seemed like you were saying that uh, the methods for determining intelligence were very like black box approach. They were very observational. They were based on inputs and outputs, not necessarily trying to model or see what's actually going on inside the box. Um, is there any reason that that's been the case is it like a, according to your research, um, it seems as though people have just been using a black box approach to determining intelligence. Is that correct? Do you um, know what I mean? Some people have. The ones who are trying to produce general theories of intelligence in terms of engines for learning patterns linking inputs and outputs. That's, that's a subset of researchers. There are other researchers who are still just trying to find out what kinds of things various animals and humans can do uh, without having any deep theories about what enables them to do that. They regard that as something in the future. There are others who think if only we study brains in enough detail and uh, start dissecting neurons to find out how they work and so on, then we might be able to reassemble them, uh, sorry, uh, to assemble artificial brain components with the similar properties to the ones we found and then we'll see how putting these artificial ones together might be able to produce the same results as putting as the original ones. I suspect that's going to be a deep failure because it's going to be very difficult to find out what the, the actual neurons are doing uh, and the current technology and likely future technology for finding out what they're doing may not actually tell us what they're doing if most of what they're doing is sub-microscopic complex molecular interactions as opposed to electrical signals going from here to there and so on which you can measure in computers. Um, and by the way Turing hinted at that in his 1950 paper there's a sentence that says uh, chemistry is at least as important as electricity for brains. I, I may have not 
got the exact words right. It's in section four of his uh, paper on computer machines and, and intelligence. And he would start working on chemistry later on, his 1952 paper on the chemical basis of, of morphology, uh, of morphogenesis indicated there. So anyway, so if, if uh, all the important interactions happen at the level of neurons and signals between neurons, maybe by finding out how they do it, we'll be able to see patterns and then work out how to put things together like that. If it's at the molecular level that some of the most important things are going on, and that's certainly happening when brains are built, it's done by chemistry, um, and there's an awful lot of maintenance going on, that's chemical and so on, and there are neurotransmitters and pheromones and hormones and heaven knows what else that are part. If, if you take some alcohol, it may change your saying yes to saying no or something, or change the way you, um, what you see. So there's a lot of chemistry in there. And uh, the chemical interactions can't be observed by any kind of technology that's on the horizon. But nevertheless, uh, I'm not saying it's impossible to find out how it works. I just think it may take very much longer than anyone believes. And uh, I just don't believe that any of the current approaches to trying to get some sort of human-like or even monkey-like or dog-like or cat-like intelligence in a robot in the next uh, few decades will succeed. Um, it may be that I, there's just some sort of breakthrough around the corner that I don't know about. It could be a theoretical breakthrough, could be a technological breakthrough for investigating brains, it could be another kind of technological breakthrough for assembling brain-like components in entirely new ways as opposed to putting chips together and and saying well these electrical signals will mirror what the, what the neurons are doing which may be true at some level but if what the neurons are doing that's important is not electrical signals but the chemical ones then it won't work anyway that's a sort of long rambling collection of reasons why i think the problems may be much harder than people now think Sure. And that we need to explore many more directions than are currently being explored. Mm. Mm. And in yeah. my case, yeah. mm. sorry, carry on. No, sorry, you were going to say, in your case. I was just going to say, in my case, I'm just trying to collect examples of things humans and other animals can do and trying to analyze them in terms of why they're hard to fit into current computational paradigms. Mm. Um, and either that will lead me or somebody else to find ways of making them fit, or it'll lead me or someone else to come up with a design for a new computational paradigm that extends what we've currently got in a way that maybe chemistry could, but I don't know. Um, or it may just turn out to be a dead end and it may not lead anywhere. Hmm. But so, certainly I'm finding lots of examples. Hmm. So um, it seems though there's, what, what interests me is um, some forms of deep learning that have come about in the last couple of years. One of them by a company called DeepMind, was, which was sold to Google recently. That was recently. Jeffrey, Hinton's, uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Hinton's company and his students. Okay, yes, right. I'm not sure about Jeffrey Hinton. Um, but yeah, Hinton. Hinton. Yes, I know him. He used to work at Sussex University when I was yeah, there, and we yeah. used to have long arguments. Okay, <laughs> he's yeah. very, very bright, and yeah, uh, he's, he's one of the leaders in that area. Yeah, it was Demis Habasis. I think it was his company. I know of people like Shane Legg who are on the board of it and all that sort of thing. But it was, maybe it's the same one, maybe it's a different one. However, the experiment was um, it could receive just a stream of pixels, that is, monitor data, um, that included like just pixel information and numbers and like shapes moving around the screen. And there were games, right? Um, so there were just like screencasts of games. And the, the, the AI learnt um, what to do. I mean, at first it was just bumbling around trying to do pretty much anything it could by moving shapes and all that, but it wasn't programmed, it wasn't told anything about what to do or what it was supposed to be doing. It wasn't even given a goal, as far as I understand. All it was doing, all, all it was received was pixel information and maybe a score, a number, <laughs> right? Um, and so it learned how to play all sorts of Atari and arcade games um, very, very efficiently, and that's... Uh, an, an example of, uh, I, I think, a cross breed between reinforcement learning and um, deep learning. 
uh, that that seem to be able to achieve such a thing. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Okay, that's different from what I knew about uh, the work of Hinton's group, which has gone into the speech understanding of uh, Google and uh, pattern recognition of digits and so on. Um, and I don't know that work, and it sounds as if it might well be going in the sort of direction that I think is needed. Uh, uh, another person who's doing work a bit like that is uh, Ben Kuypers, the University of um, Michigan, I think he is now. K-U-I-P-E-R-S with students and he um, had a robot that had an array of lasers that could do range finding in a, this is a horizontal array so it could work out distances to contact in various directions but it didn't know anything about the order of these uh, the range, range finders it just knew it had them and then it started use, doing statistics on the patterns of uh, it was also on a it on wheels and could move so it could send signals to its motors so it would move and the patterns on these of distance measures on the range finders would keep changing and using statistical methods it would it was able to work out the the which uh, rate finders were neighbors of each other because they of the way they correlated in the way they changed their readings so if two things are close together and then it moves together they would change together if they were further apart it moved together they might not change their distances because they were looking at different things in different distances anyway and likewise if they rotated so it sort of built up a way of interpreting its own inputs and then it was able to work out that there's stuff out there that behaves consistently and maintains its position as it moved around and put in different directions. And then it could start coping with things moving in the environment because it had a notion of a sort of fixed environment and there were things moving. But that all worked with a, a one-dimensional array of range finders um, and a two-dimensional world. Mm. My suspicion is that with a three-dimensional world and the two-dimensional array of range finders, it would have exploded combinatorially and been totally intractable. But I, you know, that's my guess about the statistics. But I haven't done the maths, and I don't know if cleverer people than I am would work out how to make it work. But things like that are valuable experiments in trying to understand the problems that evolution had to solve, because it's clear that Evolution explored many different kinds of sensors in many different kinds of combinations and uh, ways of producing internal mechanisms that could deal with inputs and outputs that in, in ways that enabled organisms to survive and reproduce and therefore replicate the mechanisms. Um, and that is certainly one of the ways of making progress, trying to find uh, these domains in which a particular kind of uh, technique is productive. Mm. I suspect there, there may be hundreds of such domains uh, that different organisms at different stages in our evolutionary history had to develop competences in relation to. And um, different current organisms are products of different evolutionary trajectories squirrels and weaver birds and elephants and porpoises and, 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 and um, termites and so on. Um, so it's a fascinating field. There's a huge amount still to be done. Um, I'm reasonably optimistic that progress can be made, but it requires students to learn good questions and to distinguish them from bad questions. Mm -hmm. And the question, what's a good test for intelligence, is a bad question question, what kinds of mechanisms are capable of producing different sorts of competences? What kinds of competences do different sorts of organisms need? Those are good questions. Mm, right. Excellent. Huh. <laughs> so, um, just, uh, I guess, in, in concluding, well, do you think this passing of the Turing test will be a symbolic milestone that people will recognize in the future, or look back at it and say, well, this is when it happened? Do you no. Think this, no. <laughs> Uh, there will always be debates about whether it happened 40 years ago with Colby's uh, Parry or five years ago with some other test that happened. Yeah. Part of the reason for that is that all of these different tests have slightly different conditions set up. Mm. 
Mm. For instance, I mentioned the split screen and five minutes. Uh, as I have no idea whether any other uh, setup has used that. And it could be argued that you need longer than, than five minutes um, and uh, with, with two things, you might need five minutes each, because it's quite possible that the people who are fooled by this Eugene Goosen's program, whatever it was, in that short time might not have been fooled if they had another two and a half minutes. So you'll have debates about things like that. And um, there are other debates about, I mean, I think some of the debates are a bit silly. For instance, the fact that this particular machine was designed to emulate a teenage Russian whose English wasn't very good. I've seen some people say that's cheat because the fact that its incompetence is disguised by a linguistic inability changes the parameters of the game and makes it an unfair, gives it an unfair advantage. I think that's a bit silly because we weren't told anything about, you know, teenage uh, Russians or anything. We just had to test what was in, we just had to assess what we saw happening in response to our inputs to the... But um, academics will have their debates <laughs> and disagreements no matter what. Mm, that's true. Hmm. Well, it's possible that a subset of people will say this was the day, you know, the ones who were involved in the, in the event and their friends yeah. <laughs> and their students. Yeah, I think it turned up on Wikipedia pretty much straight away. Um, somebody added the entry that it was passed on such and such a date. I don't know if it's still there, but uh, mm. well, um, no doubt there was a collection of such things planned in advance, and um, people went to work. Mm. If only they put an effort into telling me how well I'd done. <laughs> 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 that would have been a bit more clear. But anyway, oh. I will eventually be told. Yeah, mm. I suspect I got them all, but of course I'd like to know if I'm wrong. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, all right. Well, um, yeah. If there's any, if there's any take-home messages that you'd like to give people uh, at the end of this interview, then what would that be? I think we need to think deeply about our educational system. I meet people who have PhDs in AI, robotics, and so on, and have never learned any Euclidean geometry. Um, I have, uh, I know people who are proposing projects that can only be, be worked on if you find people who have themselves studied several different disciplines and they try to make them work by saying, well, I'll get a psychologist and a neuroscientist and a biologist and a roboticist and put them together. I don't think that works. I don't think that works. You have to have an educational system that gets all those different disciplines into lots of people's heads and that's a big challenge too and it may not be impossible with humans. Uh, that would be sad. So we may have to wait for robots to come up with good theories about how to make good robots. But mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, it's been wonderful having you here. Well, and it's been an awesome interview. So yeah. It's nice and nice to talk to you again. Yeah, thanks yeah. for setting it up. Ah, oh, thanks very much, Aaron. And um, yeah, I'll post this online.